Welcome back. For the final video in this week's uh, series, we're going to be talking about what are called flip-flops. There's one more problem that crops up when you try to use these clocked latches. And we'll see what that problem is and we'll see how you fix it. And the fix turns out to be something which in computer science is known as a flip-flop. So let's look at the problem with a clocked latch, like we defined before. For instance, a clocked and or latch in the previous video. The problem is that they react too quickly. And before saying what this means, let me show you an example. We'll build something called a shift register. And in building this, we can see immediately why these clock latches are not sufficient to do what we want. What's a shift register? Consider the following scenario. You have four modules, whatever they are, that store a bit. So this stores a zero or a one. So you might think this is something like a latch like we defined earlier. But for now, just think of it as some abstract system which can store one piece of information. There's an input wire going into this first one. And that has an output wire, which feeds into the second one as an input wire. And so on until we get to the end. So you can think of this as flowing from this side to this side. And that's exactly what's happening. Because what I want to happen is every clock cycle, I want all the data to shift over. So if, this, if there's a one here, then this one should move over to here and be replaced by whatever is in the input wire. Whatever's in this last box gets bumped off and erased and forgotten. So let's say I give a one in this input wire. Then I change my clock. I turn the clock on. That one got shifted into here and all the zeros got shifted over. If I keep my input wire as a one, then I can do this again. I run the clock again, and now both of my ones have shift shifted into the first two positions and there are zeros at the end. Now let's change the input wire into a zero and run the clock again. On the next clock cycle, the two ones that were here shifted over. The zero at the end got deleted and replaced by the zero that was here, and the zero that was in the input wire got pushed into the first box. You can guess what will happen in the next three clock cycles. The two ones in the middle shift over and over, which means that the last one gets deleted and replaced with this one and over. And then we're back to the original state. And all the time in those last three steps, this data input wire stayed as a zero. So zeros were being fed into the circuit. This is what's called a shift register and is used, for instance, if you want to buffer data. Let's say I want to input data from this last thing into some system, but I want to keep track of the last eight bits that were put into this system. Then I would want something like a shift register because maybe I have I take the outputs of these four things and I do something else with them while I'm waiting for them to go into my system that I want to use. Anyway, these things are useful. That's the point. So one thing you can try to do is build this using these circuits. So this is what I had in the previous video. And it's a clocked and or latch with a single input, which I call data. Since this is a very complicated thing, I want to abstract it and just write it using a symbol. Data is one input, the clock is another input, and this light bulb is the output. So D is going to stand for data. This uh, greater than sign will stand for the clock, and Q is what we will denote as the output. So anytime I draw one of these, really what you should think of is an entire circuit like this, but I'm drawing it like this for simplicity. So as I said, D corresponds to this one, greater than corresponds to this one, and Q the output. Now we can see the problem with these clock latches. And I've left this up here in case you want to reference back to what this thing is. I can try to build a shift register in the simplest way possible. I take my latches and I put them in sequence. I give them one input and I give a clock which simultaneously acts on all of these different uh, latches. Here I'm feeding the outputs into the inputs of the next one, and I'm feeding the output of the last one into a light bulb as well as the previous three. So let's see what happens if you try to use this setup. First I turn the latch on. 
Sorry, the switch on. Now, nothing's happened because the clock is off. And when the clock is off, this circuit is not allowed to do anything. But once the clock turns on, this circuit is now allowed to process this input. So it processes a 1, and it spits out a 1 as an output, which then feeds into the next one as an input. But since the clock is on, it's still allowed to process this. So it spits out a 1. And this happens for the entire sequence. So we wanted to implement a shift register, but the problem is that as soon as this clock turns on, this signal propagates through the whole machine without pausing. So I haven't implemented a shift register. All I've implemented is something that takes an input and immediately cascades it to all of these outputs. But that's bad. That's not what we want. So this simple clocked and or latch is not going to work for a shift register. So we need to make something better. Just to finish the simulation, I'll show you what happens when I turn this off. So the clock then goes off, the system stays in the on state. If I turn the switch off, well, the same problem occurs because as soon as the clock turns back on, this zero now propagates the whole system in the exact same way. So this is a problem. So what went wrong? The problem is that the D-latches are allowed to update any time the clock is on. And by D-latch, I mean clocked and or latch. So how can we fix this? The solution is to use something called a D-flip-flop, which I've drawn here. So let me explain what this thing does, and then it'll become clear why this is a useful fix for the problem that we saw before. Instead of using one D-latch, which is what I'm calling these things now, I have two. I have a clock input, a data input, and an output. So in the current state of this system, what's going on? The input is off, the clock is off, so nothing's happening. But the clock is feeding into the first latch, and it's feeding into the second latch inverted. This means, if you think about it, that whenever you turn this latch on, this latch turns off. And whenever this latch is on, this latch turns off because the signal coming into the clock port is the opposite if you look at the other one. And that's because of this NOT gate. So let's try to follow the propagation of the circuit and see what I mean. If I turn the switch on, nothing happens yet because the clock is off. Once the clock turns on, this signal is now allowed to propagate through here. And so it gives you a 1. But before that 1 got there, this clock turned off. So there's a 1 going into here, but this latch is not allowed to process anything because this clock input is now receiving a 0. So when the clock turns on, in other words, when it goes up, the data is allowed to be written into the first latch, but it's not allowed to be written into the second latch. And this is nice because you can see that the opposite happens once I turn the clock off. So as, I, as soon as I turn the clock off, this latch goes off, but this one turns on. And since there's a 1 in the input, it gives a 1 as the output. Now I can do the opposite. I can turn the input switch off and run the clock yet again. The clock turns on, a 0 is written, and so a 0 comes as this output. But this output doesn't change because, well, the clock is off. But once the clock turns off, then this second latch turns on, and I'm allowed to feed in this input into the output. What's the point of this? The point is that the data is only written to the output when the clock goes from on to off. In other words, suppose I just put this whole circuit in a box and didn't allow myself to actually look at what was going on inside. Then from my perspective, the, I would only see something change in the output when the clock goes from the on state to the off state. This is called a negative edge triggered event. And if you want to understand why this is called a negative edge triggered event, this is typically how clock cycles are drawn in what's called a timing diagram. In a timing diagram, time goes from left to right, and a low line corresponds to the clock being off, and a high line corresponds to the clock being on. 
typically in a timing diagram, you'll see multiple diagrams like this stacked on top of each other, which correspond to the different inputs, but we won't look at those today. The reason this is called a negative edge triggered event is that data is only written when the clock goes from on to off, which corresponds to these right side lines, which are sort of negatively sloped. So this is what's known as a negative edge. On the other hand, this is called a positive edge. And this is a negative edge triggered event because the data at the output only changes when we pass over the negative edge. So let's see how we can use this to fix the shift register that we were trying to define earlier. Here's my D flip-flop, as I'm calling it now. And instead of drawing out the whole thing, I'm just going to draw it as this diagram. So this is similar to what I was doing before, except now I'm putting the word flip-flop here, which means that this circuit is this more complicated in circuit instead of one of these D latches. And now we can try to build a shift register in the exact same way. I've made the lines straighter here so that it's a bit more neat and easier to look at. In the beginning, everything's off, the clock is off, the input is off. Let's turn the input on. First, nothing happens because the clock is off, so no processing is allowed to happen inside of the flip-flop. Now, once I turn the clock on, something funny happens because this flip-flop is allowed to now process information because it's receiving an input. But on the other hand, I can't actually see what's happening because it's not allowed to write any data because the negative edge has not occurred yet. In other words, this first D-latch inside of here that I can't see has changed its state, but the second one is still in the same state. But now when I turn the switch off, or rather this clock off, the second latch inside of here is allowed to output the one, and so the one comes out into this output wire. So after one clock cycle, the one that I gave it has shifted into this first D flip-flop. On the other hand, the one that's going into the second D flip-flop is not doing anything because the clock is off, and so it's not allowed to read the data. If I turn the clock on again, then the same thing happens in the sense that there's some processing going on here now, where this first D latch in here is a one, and the first D latch in here is still a one because I haven't changed the data input wire. But it takes until I turn the clock off for these to be written to the output wires of the second flip-flop and the first flip-flop. In effect, the zero that I, sorry, the one that I put here has now shifted into the first slot, and the one that was in the first slot has shifted into the second slot. The zeros that was, that was here before has shifted into the third slot, and so on. So far, I've written one one into my shift register. Now let's turn my thing off and write zeros. Next, I turn the clock on, and nothing happens, as before. But when I turn the clock off, the zero has shifted into this place, the one has shifted into this place, and the one has shifted into this place. I'll leave this off and run through this simulation now. Clock turns on, clock turns off, the data shifts. Clock turns on, clock turns off, the data shifts. Finally, there's a one in this last slot, and I'm not reading any more ones. Clock turns on, and that one is forgotten, and we're back to the original state. So the point of this is that if you define these latches in a naive way, they don't necessarily work because you haven't solved the time sensitivity problem. By introducing feedback loops, you do solve the problem of memory. In other words, in a latch, I can remember information. But if I want to actually use these latches in a robust way, I haven't fully solved the time issue until I introduce the notion of a flip-flop. I should say at this point that there are dozens of kinds of flip-flops, and there are lots of different kinds of latches, and I'm not going to go over all of them, although I've given you a couple of others in the exercises preceding uh, this video. But if you're curious, you can 
you go on the internet and you can look up flip-flops and you can look up latches and you can see all the different ones, you can see how they work, you can see the advantages and all of the disadvantages. And I would strongly encourage you to try this out in Logically. So, this concludes the course on mathematical aspects of computer science. Um, I guess it was sort of incorrectly named because I really only talked about one mathematical aspect of computer science, which was sort of more computer science-y than math-y. But anyway, it has to do with Boolean logic and Boolean algebra. So there is a tie-in with math. And I hope that it was instructive, and I hope that it gives you a better appreciation for how digital circuitry actually works. I've given you some more exercises below for you to try and to build different digital systems using these flip-flops that you now have control of. But before I end the video, I want to show you one thing. So going back to the previous slides, you may have noticed that I said let symbol equal circuit. And I was able to produce these nice diagrams. So I want to show you how to actually do this. You can do this in logically and make it so that if you want to work with a D-latch, you don't have to draw out this whole circuit. So to do this, what you first do is you create the circuit that you want. So in this case, a D-latch. And you have to give names to each of these inputs and outputs. So this data, I'm going to name D. The clock, I will name, well, I have to actually delete the clock and replace the clock with another input. And then I will name this greater than, which is the clock symbol that we used. And this output I'm going to name Q. Then once each of these have names, I can highlight the whole thing and press this button, which is the button that says Create Integrated Circuit. I can give this thing a name. I'll call it D-Latch. And I can give it a label as well if I want. Before, I didn't give it a label, but let's say I want to call this D-latch, just so that it's clear what this is. Then I press Create New Circuit. If I then scroll to the bottom of my circuit panel, or my component panel, rather, I can drag this out. And now this circuit behaves in exactly the same way as this schematic diagram. If you right-click this D-latch and you press View Integrated Circuit, it shows you what you've defined. So let me close this. Just to show you that this is actually working in the way that I said, let's put an output here. Let's put an input into the data port. And let's instantiate a clock. OK. Now I'll wait till the clock cycle is low, and then I'll turn on the switch. Then it goes high, and it's written. turn it off, and it turns off. So this is a nice way of combining simple arrangements of logic gates into a nice simple schematic thing. So before, I had the D flip-flop, which was defined as this circuit. So what you can then do is you can build this circuit in logically using this gate that you already defined as an integrated circuit in Logically, and you can build another one. So I'll leave that for you to do if you want to play around with this construction a bit. I should mention that Logically has an implementation of a D flip-flop, but it's slightly differently built to the way that I described in the video. So if you want to use this, you have to look at their integrated circuit, and you have to try to figure out what's going on. It's a bit more complicated, and even though it's slightly more applicable to how people actually build circuits, I don't think it's the most instructive thing to use this D flip-flop. Instead, I think it's more instructive to build this D flip-flop and use this if you want to play around with this memory. So as I said, thanks for watching. See the exercises below. And thanks for attending this course.